Thank you for joining me for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Nick Despeditas, and we're going to be talking about determining fees and talking with your patients on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Before we get started with our conversation with Dr. Despeditas, I wanted to say thank you to Oculus for their support of this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Uh, Oculus does an incredible job with axial length and corneal measurements for your specialty lens or your myopia practice. Again, thanks to Oculus for their support of this episode. Well, thanks again for joining us. Today, we're joined by uh, Dr. Nick Despeditas. Nick, it is awesome to have you on the podcast finally. Thank you so much for having me on, Dave. Yeah, I've been super eager and anxious to get you on the podcast to hear some of your practice management perspectives. And certainly you've been doing myopia management in a very unique way. Would you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your unique practice? Sure. I practice in Hamilton Square, New Jersey. It's a middle, middle community. And we opened up cold with my partner, Barry Tannen, about 30 years ago. And when we opened up, it was traditional eyeglasses, soft contact lenses, and eye exams. And I would say about 10 years into the practice, around 2000 or so, somewhere around there, we noticed some drastic changes in the marketplace. You know, contacts, glasses were becoming a commodity. We were accepting more and more insurances and feeling restricted by the reimbursements and and what we could charge. And at that point, both my partner and I, very similar to your practice, pivoted. My partner, Barry, specializes in binocular vision and vision therapy and traumatic brain injury. And I grew the myopia management practice. It wasn't called that at the time, but basically I fit my sons back in you know the late 90s and saw exactly what this was about. And since that time, my practice, my part of the practice is myopia management. So we have four uh, full-time partner ODs right now. So it's grown quite a bit. We also have two full-time optometric residents. So we have one location, six ODs. And my practice, again, is developing the specialty care practice, specifically orthokeratology. Yeah. And, and you've been doing this, you know, is, is that the only thing that you see? Are myopia management only patients that you see, or do you see a variety of others? No, it's, it's very interesting. I have a, I don't accept any insurance. You know, it was a very right. gradual change back in 2000. We dropped eyeglass plans and really, you know, got through that stage and really prospered. And subsequently, my ortho K practice grew. That was my myopia management. So right now I see full-time myopia management patients and private pay patients that want to see me. So my section of the office, yes, I'm not only in charge of growing the practice, but I see patients with my two partners. So we have a a very unusual practice. Monday through Friday, all day, we're seeing some type of myopia management, primarily orthokeratology patients. I leave Wednesday morning for private pay patients, patients that I like seeing, keeping my skills up. My other partner sees the medical optometry. So whenever I suspect glaucoma or anything medically related, including dry eye, I have a partner that really focuses on that. Again, binocular vision, vision therapy. My partner, Barry Tannen, sees them. And anything else like primary care patients that want to be seen by any other doctor routinely, they'll see my other partner. Excellent. And are you 100% insurance free or do you take medical insurance? Anything at all? Yeah, I'm 100% medical free. And it's been a very gradual uh, stepwise uh, process. You know, we started, my God, in 1999, I am telling you, we were inundated with patients. We were six weeks booked out. Uh, We accepted every plan. They just they're, they're insidious, right? They keep growing on you. They blossom. There's so many blues. And, and before I knew it, I had 50 plans. We were very busy, uh, very busy, but not profitable. And it just, you know, as an OD, sometimes we just don't understand how can we be so busy, gross so much money, 
and yet at the end of the week, not have enough funds for the partners. And, you know, we're not rocket scientists, but we learn slowly. And we realize, listen, just because we're busy is not translating to profitability. Maybe the olden days where you were very busy and that translated to good income, net income. I think in today's market, because we're capitated in different ways, in several ways, including online competition, busy doesn't translate to profitability. No. So we don't, I don't accept medical plans. Now my two partners do, but they're very restrictive. It's Medicare, it's Aetna, and I think it's it's a blue, like Horizon or, or Blue Cross Blue Shield. But it's because they chose to accept those ones, right? That's exactly and right. Specific. And then yeah. very strategically, and you know this, is you run several practices. We never know what the right decision is. It takes a lot of debate back and forth. Should we continue accepting this? We know we're going to lose patience. It's a scary thing when you lose volume. But then again, will that yield more room for specialty care patients? We'll have more time to talk about dry eye or another passion of yours or, or myopia management, which ultimately does translate to increased profitability, but also increased enjoyment. You know, mm -hmm. you can hear my voice like you. I've been practicing longer than you a long time. You know, it's encroaching so long that I don't even want to mention it. <laughs> it's 40 years almost. And yet uh, you could hear it. I'm enthusiastic. I have a good life. Uh, so it's a win-win situation. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. But it's not for everyone. It's not for the weak at heart. You know this. Have done. You told me you've been doing OrthoK now for 20 years, is it? Mm -hmm. Just about. I, Yep. It's incredible. I know yeah. exactly what you've been through, even though I don't mm -hmm. know you, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of learning the learning curve, you know, the, the difficult fits, the patients you can't fit, um, learning how to present your fees in a way yeah. that's accepted by patients, knowing it's not accepted by insurance. That's the, the yeah. biggest stumbling block. Yeah. You know, Nick, what, one of the things that you mentioned that I hear time and time again with doctors that I talk to is that I'm too busy to do yeah. whatever it is that I'm more interested in. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is we run those numbers when we get really busy in our practice, our revenue per encounter goes down, right? Because right. we don't have time to talk about the things that we care about with our patient. And so doctors, they're so busy doing all these things, their revenue is dropping, their enjoyment is dropping. And, you know, overall, the practice just becomes this machine that is right. just running and it's, there's no personality, which is why we went into it is to love our patients, right? hundred percent. And unfortunately for me, it took me about 10 years into practice to learn that because you're right. You're running on an old paradigm is that the busier I am, the more successful I am. And we're always looking at that gross. As long as the gross is going up, we think we're doing well, but very insidiously, I remember again, it was around 2000. We increased our capacity we were seeing three exams an hour and two checks. So five patient encounters at that time. I remember it very clearly. And I just got more efficient, like we're supposed to do with technology and staffing. So we upped it to four exams an hour plus two checks. So now I'm up to six patient encounters an hour. So like you said, it's exactly what you said. I'm hustling. I'm exhausted at the end of the day. My staff is not happy. I'm not happy. And I, quite frankly, I don't think my patients were happy. Yeah. But yet when we looked at the numbers, my profitability went down, even though I increased my exam capacity by 25%. Yeah. Isn't that something? That's yeah. just amazing. So, you know, here's the thing with orthokeratology and doing myopia management. People think, oh my goodness, you know, I'm seeing 10, 15, 37 exams per hour. Uh, joking, but you know, four or five exams per hour, my revenue and ortho K is going to take me this, but like, I don't know how to set a fee for that. Is there, is there an equation you've worked out? I have this equation that I talk to people about, but is there some sort of equation of how do you figure out what the fees should be for ortho K or in your myopia management? And maybe you separate those, right? In my office, I've got adults who are doing ortho keratology and that's a different time requirement than a myopia management case. Right. How do you go about that, Nick? You know, I, I speak about two different things to think of fees. The nice thing about myopia management, even in today's market where it has become 
much more competitive. You have to know your chair course. You have to know yeah. your comfort of practicing. You know, having done this for many years, some of us just like to fit the ortho K lens. There's no fluff around it. I got you fit. I got you seen as best as I can. I slow down your axial growth the best I can. I'll check you in a year, whatever the case may be. And that should be one fee category. I call that standard of care. You're doing a great job fitting the patient, but no more fluff. Maybe it's good for, if, for that patient that's busy, but wants to get clinically challenged by ortho -K and bring in a profit center. But then there's what I call excellent care. It's the one that goes a little bit further, talks about hygiene, visual hygiene, going to play outside, uh, talks about screen time and screen addiction and things of that nature that keeps kids inside. Maybe gives a snack, you know, maybe asks how your pet are doing. How are you doing? How's school doing? That's a different level of care. Now, it doesn't make me better or worse if I'm providing standard or care versus excellent care but that's a different fee structure. So you have to know yourself. We all practice differently. I have six doctors in my practice and, and you probably have even more that work for you because you have multiple locations. I've tried to standardize the way the doctors practice. It doesn't happen. We're, we're cowboys, cow women. You know, we're just, <laughs> we practice the way we practice. I've tried to standardize, I can't. So you are who you are. So that you have to define who you are. And then what I try to do in my practice is I do what's called first class care. That's the highest level of care possible. It means emailing you almost concierge. You, you know how the primary yeah. doctors have gotten away from this, this uh, kind of managed care. And, and that's, that's what my service is. Basically, I have systems where I can email you and you can email me. We could text anytime you have a question or concern. I'm right there. I'm also going to speak to your child about anything that's on their mind, because as you know, there's a child behind those eyeballs. And I love talking to the kids and making sure that I'm helping them beyond their vision. So we have three levels of care, right? Then you look at your chair course. Some of us have a mom and pop practice. Mom and pop practices, you have one or two staff members up front. You do your preliminary testing, and then you do your testing. That's very different than maybe your chair course where you have probably a lot of technicians, a lot of technology. So you have to know what your chair cost is. And that's easy. You figure out how much you need to make to break even at the end of the day. I think we all know that nut at the end of the day. If we've made this number, then we've broken even. Anything over that is, is our net. And you divide that by the number of hours that you practice. So ortho K like you said, I don't see adults. So that's one of the things I've, I think my success is due. I'm able to narrow my focus more and more. I just see pediatric myopic children. I don't fit hyperopes. I don't fit adults. So for me, in order to give that upper class care, it takes me at least six hours a year, you know, in a year, so the 20 minute checks, the consultation, six to nine hours, literally six hours of solid hours a year. So let's say my chair cost in my practice is $300 an hour. That's a yep. multidisciplinary practice, not huge, but certainly bigger than the mom and pop. The pop, mom and pop may be 150, half that mm -hmm. price. So let's say take my chair course is somewhere about $300. It takes me six times three. So what is that? That's $1,800 18. mm -hmm. about, correct? Yeah. My math is right. Let's see, 300 yeah, $1,800. And I didn't even pay for the lenses. So if I just capitate my fees at this, what I feel you're charging or next door's charging, I, my gross is still high, but I haven't made a net. So I think what the way I calculate it is very sensibly. I don't think about what is my competitors charging? What is the market charging? I think about who is Nick Despotitas? I can't deliver standard of care just in my makeup, you hear I'm talking now, I'm biting your ear off, you know? It's not like, just like one, two word answers. So I had to decide what kind of care I'm gonna give and then make sure that whatever my chair cost is, I double it. So in that yeah. case scenario, in the fictitious scenario we're giving, if it's $1,800, I'm gonna be starting at 3,600. Yep. And you're mm -hmm. like, wow, but I heard the stand. Well, they are not, you, you know, ortho case like VT. It's yeah. general terms. My VT may be very different from what you provide in your practice. Same thing with ortho K. 
Mm -hmm. And I think once the practitioner can break through the barrier of what others are charging and what does it make sense for you to charge to make your bell ring, to make you feel good, your practice will start to fill up. It doesn't look, I've been doing this since 2000. So we're talking with 2023. So it's 23 years that's taken me to build this practice up. But it's a beautiful practice because I make the rules. I make sure I buy by the rules. And it provides my patient with great care, fantastic care. I would say first-class care, but it also affords me a very enjoyable practice to walk into every day. And not many of us can say that. Yeah. No, you know, you know, Nick, you bring up some good points here. First of all, I want to reiterate that when you're determining your fees, you start with what you need right? And then you go to what you want, right? That's correct. I think it's really critical for us as as clinicians, because sometimes it's like, well, you know, I think the patient would pay this. And we don't do that anywhere else. Um, We need to figure out those numbers based on the value that we're bringing, right? A first class care being very different than kind of standard of care should require a different amount. One of the analogies we always talk about in our office is we're a steakhouse. And there's some people who want hamburgers, And that's okay. There are other places that provide hamburgers, but we can't provide a steak at a hamburger price, right? And so we need to make sure that we're providing the top type of care and the level of care that we want, right? Somebody who's coming in to see you and is just demanding lower costs, they're not going to get the service that you provide, right? You can't provide that at a lower dollar amount. And you have to be okay to say, this patient may not be the right one for our practice. There's other practices that can do this. So, so the next thing I want to ask you is, how do you go about talking about that with parents before they start myopia management? And how do you talk to the kids, like particularly around this, this fee structure? And then we'll talk about you know, presenting myopia to the child. But now this higher fee structure, this is very different. Where do you, what do you have to walk through to get them there? I just want to reiterate what you said, because I think this is key. You can't be everything to everyone. Right. No. Nope. And you got to learn that. And I think insurance companies may have taken advantage of us wanting to help everyone. You know, I, I can't believe like my fees for medical things like punctal plugs get cut in half or OCTs and just like cut that. in half. Yeah. And we, we just accept it. It's like you go to your dealership, you bring your car to the dealership, you know, whether it's a Honda, Toyota, or Lexus, and they say you need four brakes. And you say, okay, but I'm only going to pay you for two. And the mechanic says, okay, well, I guess I want to stay busy. It makes no sense anywhere, including in a medical practice. So that was a really good point. As far as me, and I think this is a great point for your listeners to take, you have to realize it takes a lot of work to get the first few patients. Yeah. But what I've learned and what I've taught is if you do an amazing job with those first few patients, they become influencers. You know how everybody talks about influencers on Instagram and things like that. Well, there's influencers in practice. You've had them. There's these patients that just refer to us. They just love it. You got to go to Dr. Kading. He's the best. Don't even buy. Well, he's not even my plan. I don't care. You go see him. We have them. They're not a lot, right? But that's who I call influencers. So in the beginning, when you have a myopic child that the parent is visibly upset that they are getting worse, that's your candidate, right? They're going to, we all get those cases. There are other people that say, eh, just give me the script. I'll get the lenses at Costco. They're soft lenses or whatever the case may be. Or it's another year, my plan covers for another pair of glasses. So even though their child has not, has progressed in myopia, the parent is not visibly shaken. But we've had this patient that the parent that's almost crying there, that the child's eyes have changed this is your opportunity to shine. So if you don't have time, like a lot of practitioners are telling you, I didn't have the time either. Remember, I was doing like four exams plus two checks at my height. You set up a time saying, listen, I'm going to update their glasses, but this is not acceptable. They're going from seeing the 2040 line to the 2100 line. And look, they can't even see the big E. So there's a lot of new technologies available. And I don't want to rush through this. We'll set up a time to talk or we'll set up a consultation. And that's how I do it. I always set up a consultation and or 
a virtual call beforehand if I need to get the parent involved, because you know, having done VT also, you need parents to understand what this is about. If you start saying, well, there's this soft lens called my sight, and we're going to try these compounded eye drops, and there's this lens that molds your child's eye at night, they're going to look at you like you have two heads. So yeah. what I've learned is I got to spend a lot of time initially for the first few fits. Wow them to death, even if you're not the wower, because you want the fit. Once they enroll in your program, now you have to wow them through the first few weeks, first few months. You know that the kid's in uncomfortable, the kid's not motivated, the parent is very nervous that things are going wrong. It doesn't matter if you charge 1000 or 10000 parents are nervous. I've found that, I don't know if you found this also, Dave, is the parent interested in myopia management as an alternative to conventional eyewear or glasses or contacts is a different character trait. They have a different character trait. They're nervous. They're inquisitive. They're very educated usually. Mm -hmm. So you got to make the time to answer their questions. And this is the payoff. It's like dividend reinvesting. You invested very slowly in your first few patients. And what happens? One of those parents or quite a few start educating other parents like themselves on ortho -K. And they say, you got to go see Dr. D. He, he, my child sleeps with these lenses. It's expensive. It's not covered by insurance. So you can see what's happening. All the questions All the, the questions. patients have, the influencer is taking care of. As long mm -hmm. as you've followed the steps and taken your time, then the next few patients are much e easier. The barrier to entry is much lower. So subsequently, that's how my practice grew. I held hands painstakingly through the process. And then slowly but surely, each subsequent referral did not take as much handholding to sign up. They still take a lot of handholding those first three months, the insertion removal class, the first few weeks of wearing, when they lose the lens, break a lens, they can't see, one eye is better than the other, they have pain, there's tearing, this, all this stuff, you hold their hand. And I promise you, I have no reason to lie. You will start getting referrals regardless of whether insurance covers this or not. But you got to pay the toll. You got to yeah. pay the price of holding that parent's hand and the child's hand. And we could talk about the child because they're equally important through the first few months. Yeah. And, you know, I think a, a real important aspect of that is you can't do that at an eye exam, right? No. And so you have to bring those people back. You have to spend that extra little bit of time and you can't do it at a 10 minute check, right? Or You're 20 need... minute check. No, nope. because you're going to need at least a half hour or yeah. more. And, and if you can call them ahead of time and prepare the way, or, you know, some people are making videos that are, you know, answer some yep. of those questions. You lose a little bit of that first class touch when you do no that, time. but at least it, it's, at least it's getting some right. of those questions yeah. that maybe the influencer uh, would, would do in the future. I think exactly. that's really important. Now share with us that equally important part of how you're talking to the, to the patient. And I love what you do is you kind of tell the parent at that virtual call, hey, listen, I'm going to be just be focusing on your kid when you're in here, right? Like, this is all about the kid and we got to get them on board. I love that, what you, you do. Know, you know, you I don't know where you heard that from, but that's exactly what I do. You're an excellent <laughs> student. It's probably the key to your success because you're 100% right. Because if you have children, if your child is happy and feels safe and likes where they're at, you're going to like them. You try, you treat my sons with respect and care and tenderness. I like you already. Price is not an issue when it comes to our children. It, it just isn't. It, it's many other things, but not when it comes to our children. So yeah, I tell this parent, dude, the virtual conference, we're going to get the complete history and all your questions. I had one today, Dave. I think it took 35 minutes for this virtual call to get done because she had axial length questions, pachymetry questions, pachymetry questions. That's not a pachymetry <laughs> not questions. So, but this is my demographic. So then what happens is I get them all out of the way. And then I say, okay, when Johnny comes in, I'm going to be totally focused on Johnny because you know what? Johnny's only nine years old. They don't want to touch their eye. They don't want to put a hard lens in their eye. And Johnny's not unhappy. 
they get new glasses, they see, they wear them. Sometimes they don't like wearing them, but they're not unhappy squinting. So now my focus has got to be on your child. And then when I'm done determining what's the best option for your child, it could be my site, it could be vision therapy, it could be atrophy, whatever the case may be, then I'll leave plenty of time for questions. And I really do think of all the things I do, that's my unique selling proposition. Dr. D doesn't rush you. Dr. D leaves time for questions. Can it be that simple? And the answer is 100%. It's that simple, but it's that difficult. Because like you said, we're trained to be busy. We're trained to see patients every 20 minutes or every half an hour, whatever that interval is for you. And when a patient requires more than that interval, they feel rushed. And if they feel rushed, that's the end of the influencer. The, the deal yeah. is broken. It's that fragile. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Dr. D, I have to ask, you're spending an incredible amount of time in that first year with the yes. patient, six to yeah. nine. Do, do your fees and does your time requirement drop in the second, third, fourth, yeah. 23rd These year? Really good questions, Dave, because I left out one important part. Not only do our fears reflect the amount of effort needed, you know, these visits that you're referring to, I know that this parent, it doesn't matter if they're minus one or minus six, that's asking me about pachymetry, and am I going to give her the A scans every visit, the results of the A scan? They are a different level than the parent that's what we call the, the visual slob. Remember when we used to do um, yep. you know, laser vision correction? It was 20 happy. That was happy. it. Yeah. I don't get 20 happy. <laughs> I get my right eye is good. My left eye is bad. You know, my left eye is good. So I have different levels to accommodate that. The second year, it drops down to four. And I want to explain why. In my office, I just equate that with good care. I get to see the lenses on the eye. I get to see the lenses. I get to see if the lens is centered. I don't like surprises. But each visit is a marketing opportunity for me. It's a time to talk about cell phone use. That's a, that's a big topic among all us parents is our kids mm -hmm. are tethered to their phones. Here's a doctor finally making the time to talk about, is this good or bad? How much of it? You know, what are the side effects? Parents think it's blue light. They're surprised to hear it's a lot more than blue light. Let me tell you. you I have to interrupt you. I saw the video where you talked to the little boy about his YouTube time. And he's like, I'm not watching YouTube as much, right? Yeah. Who's yeah. going to get a kid to reduce their, unless you spend the time and tell them why I loved that video, by yeah. the way. Yeah, that's on LinkedIn. And, and I see you do your homework, which is fantastic. So people are going to say, Dr. Caden, talks about a lot more than the eyes. I hear that all the time. And all you talked about was, hey, maybe you shouldn't be eating and watching YouTube all the time. And every three minutes, watch YouTube. You took the time to explain to this eight or 10 year old while the parent is listening, because you've become an advocate for the parent, right? Yeah. Now the parent could say, listen, even the doctor has said, you should watch about a half an hour YouTube a day. You're only nine years old. And, and I always tell the parent, they're, they ultimately decide, but you got some guidelines is better than no guidelines. So you get it. You get it totally. You watch my LinkedIn. You kind of come to my lectures, but you absorb it. You're, you're open-minded. And that's why I wanted to do this podcast is that you learned. And, and we said it before we came on. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I'm learning every day, every yeah. day. It's a, it's a blast. You know, with all this knowledge in your head, is there some way that somebody who's listening could come and learn more from you? Can you just share a little bit about yeah. your supercharge? There's, I'm very aligned with Vision by Design is the Ortho K yeah. Society. It's the American Academy of Ortho K and Myopia My Management. And they have a huge symposium in September. This year, it's in Chicago. It's early in September. And it's called Vision by Design. And I lecture there every year. I'm very indebted to them because 20 years ago, I didn't know how to fit a lens. I would speak to people like yourself that would share their background and be very generous. And I lecture there every year at their boot camp and sometimes at their main symposium. I also give a workshop only at Vision by Design. It's called Supercharger Practice. And you could go to the website, superchargerpractice.com. And I offer a one day all immersion course where you pay one tuition and you leave with a step-by-step -step guide on what you're going to do when you get back. How 
What fees, you already established fees during the workshop. How are you going to implement them? How are you going to implement what makes sense for you, Dave? I think that's what we're getting away from. Everybody thinks I need to do everything. I need to do dry eye and neural lens and glasses and soft contacts and vision therapy, et cetera, et cetera. You can't be everything to everyone. We said that. And that includes specialty care. So you leave with a very clear plan and a path of how you're going to implement it when you go home. And I've been given this workshop literally since 2006, just once a year at the Vision by Design meeting. I'd love to have some of your listeners come and at least test it out. And the best part about it, it's 100% money back guarantee. You just have to give back your workbooks at the end if you're not happy. And the reason I give that, to be honest with you, at the end of the workshop, there's just no one that would even consider, even if they came in thinking, you know, I'm going to give Nick back his workshop. It's that much of myself I give to them. Yeah. I know you're exhausted at the end of those days because you just give, give, give. I've, I'm I've, not exhausted. I've... <laughs> They're exhausted. I am. I'm like right now I am pumped up. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, Nick, I, I could take an, a, another five hours of your time, but we're going to have to do that at the supercharge. I sure okay. appreciate you sharing your perspectives. Any any last things you want to bring up here or touch on about specialty care and taking time for your patients? Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, the, the, the slogan that I used for my workshop is one that it's your life, your practice, your way. And I think sometimes we've gotten away from that, right, Dave? It's kind of like we got, you said it yourself, we got into this profession to care for patients uniquely. And somehow it gets away from us pretty quickly and we get on the treadmill, like you put it, and it's hard to get off. I'm here to tell you, I'm a seasoned practitioner, is that if you have enough courage to make the tough decisions, you'll be infinitely rewarded. So it is your, your life, your practice, your way, have the courage to do it. That's the advice I give. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here and thank you, the listener for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like, and subscribe. Stay tuned for future episodes of the myopia podcast. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes. 